First of all, many thanks to you, to Convoco for the invitation. I really feel very, very honored to be able to say a few words here now, even before Professor Lenhard, and I'm looking forward to what's about to happen. I think it is appropriate for me to fulfill my role here by, first of all, recommending this book by Mr. Leonhard to anyone who has not yet read it. If you read it carefully, it won't take you a whole week to read it. You can digest it during a long weekend, but you will be much smarter afterwards than you were before. At least that's how I felt when I read it over the Christmas holidays. So I really congratulate you on this work, which is not big in size for a historian, but that's the attractive thing about it, that you don't sit in front of a thick tome and wonder whether it might be better to leave it on the desk. So a big recommendation. I think I can, in the few minutes that I have now in my role, I can't really talk about the conclusions of past wars and the way in which they were brought to an end, but rather about experiences from the present or from the most recent past. And I would perhaps like to start with an observation. Over the past few long years when I had to speak on such topics, I have said something that has now in the face of the war in Ukraine proven to be utterly wrong. I have said, ladies and gentlemen, when it comes to wars and the way they are started, and therefore also the question of how to bring them to an end, there is an essential difference between the way wars used to be and the way wars are today. In the past, when my grandfather fought against the French in the First World War, and when my father fought as, a, as an Air Force officer in the Second World War, it was essentially, I always put it like that, it was about wars between states that were rivals or arch enemies, etc., etc. Now, at the beginning of the 21st century, that is a thing of the past, ladies and gentlemen. Essentially, we're only dealing with wars within states. Take Iraq, for example, take Afghanistan. Of course, there are external influences, foreign interventions, support for one or the other, but ultimately, these are wars between ethnic, religious, or other groups within a state. That is the new form of conflict that we have to deal with intellectually, politically, diplomatically, strategically, militarily. It turns out that was completely wrong. With the war Russia unleashed in Ukraine, as we all know now, the tanks are rolling again. Borders are being drawn between sovereign neighboring states in Europe Contrary to all the work of my colleagues, my contemporaries at the Federal Foreign Office, entire generations of diplomats, we, we, we worked on it after the Charter, after the Helsinki Final Act on the Charter of Paris, which was in 1990. We worked on establishing a reliable peace order today. We call it a security order for the whole of Europe or even the Euro-Atlantic area. So now the finding really is that war is back. War is back as a phenomenon, classic war between states in Europe. In other words, and, and, and that is tragic, not only for me personally, but I think for all of us, it is really tragic that this edifice of a reliable, lasting security order has actually collapsed because of Russia, because of Russian decisions. First comment. Second comment. I would like to share 
a little anecdote with you. You might think when it comes to wars where religious elements play a role, just think of Northern Ireland or many other examples, then it might perhaps be a clever idea if, in order to end the war, you allow the religious leaders to play a role as princes of peace, so to speak. What would that be like? And I can tell you the following. In 1993, over 30 years ago now, I was appointed head of the then planning staff at the German Federal Foreign Office. And that was when these increasingly bloody riots began in, in Bosnia, in Bosnia-Herzegovina. And that's when we, my colleagues at the Foreign Office and I, came up with a really glorious idea, which the minister at that time also thought was great. We said, let's do the following. Let's invite the religious leaders, the most senior Catholic bishop from Banja Luka in Croatia, the Muslim leader from Sarajevo, and the Orthodox Archbishop from Belgrade. And they came too. And we had, well, I'm not Catholic myself, but I had a colleague who knew his way around and we then had the glorious idea of using famous Professor Küng from Tübingen as our moderator. He came, and then we had these three gentlemen whom we dined with very expensive wine. We were still in Bonn at the time, so very expensive wine. And then we presented them with a two-page declaration that had been carefully drafted over a period of days with the request that they please just sign it now. And it was an appeal for peace. Excellently worded, drafted by young, excellently trained diplomats. And now I have to tell you the only one who was halfway prepared to sign it if the others had gone along with it was the Catholic bishop from Croatia. The other two were absolutely against it. The Orthodox leader from the Serbian side said, quite frankly, I am in favor of the war because my ethnic group has been played with badly already 100 years ago and in the First World War and the Second World War. We have every right to achieve our goals and I support this with all my strength. In other words, since this process, and we failed miserably, not a single person signed this text. The whole thing cost us several thousand euros at the time and the result was zero. So ever since then I've been rather skeptical about involving religious leaders in peace negotiations, as you can imagine. So that's my second observation. My third point is one that if you read Professor Lenhardt's book, you will find very emphatic and thought-provoking. Namely, that not every end of a war means peace. On the contrary, there are even war termination processes that do nothing but sow the seeds for the next war. There are examples of this from recent German history. I am not a historian myself, I don't want to go into that. But the point is that not every ceasefire equals peace, and certainly not lasting peace. That is very important, not only for historians, but also for active diplomats. Please give me the opportunity to make two further comments. And this point can also be found in Professor Lenhardt's booklet. The real difficult work I, making peace, conducting negotiations, I know this from my own experience, can be difficult, can take months, can require you to spend weeks with a person who will later be convicted as a criminal of war, 
So it can also require a certain amount of moral and personal effort, but the actually difficult work always begins afterwards. Because afterwards, it's about issues such as reconciliation. It is difficult enough to work out a peace agreement on paper between diplomats, but reconciliation between those who have lost their children, their grandfathers, their uncles and aunts, either as soldiers or as civilians, that is difficult. And we also know this from our own history. South Africa, which is also a shining example, had the so-called Truth Commission after the end of apartheid. As far as I could learn, that was an enormously helpful institution, and I can only recommend it to all parties to conflict when they're trying to practice reconciliation to really face up to such challenges. My very last point, as I said, I'm speaking here as a man of practice, concerns the question how to end this war in Ukraine. Of course, I'm asked this question almost every day. What would have to happen? And I believe there is one basic truth. Of course, there are many elements that can contribute to two quarreling parties, in this case, Putin and Zelensky, deciding to seriously sit down at a negotiating table, knowing that they may have to make difficult compromises. But what does it take? And I would simply want to say, and perhaps we can discuss this afterwards, above all, there must be one central prerequisite in the head, and in this case in the head of Vladimir Putin, namely the realization that the continued use of Russian military power will no longer achieve anything, to put it bluntly. And now you can ask yourself the question, does Putin believe that any further deployment of the Russian army, the air force in Ukraine, is no longer of any use? I fear that we are not, or at least not yet, at the point where General Gerasimov, the top military, pulls himself together and tells his president, we can maybe gain another five kilometers here and two kilometers there, but Basically, that's it. That's all we can manage, Mr. President. That's why the military advice to you is enshrine everything that we've achieved at the negotiating table. As I said, I'm leaving it to you to imagine when such a state of mind, such an understanding in the head of the Russian president could have been reached in the short, medium, or distant future. The conclusion, if my reasoning is correct, the conclusion is, of course, and that is why I'm making this point here at the end, if we want to end this war, we must help to ensure that Vladimir Putin develops this state of mind, this, this understanding, hopefully sooner rather than later. And we can only do this if not only we, the Germans, we, the Europeans, we, the entire West, continue bravely as best as we can, preferably much more resolutely than in the recent past, to enable Ukraine not only to defend itself on the front line, but to even recapture as much of the Ukrainian territory as possible. Then, perhaps at some point, will we get this state of mind in Vladimir Putin's head right? And then it may be possible to enter into serious negotiations. I'm now looking forward to Professor Leonard's presentation, and thank you for listening. Thank you.